in this segment, I want to spend a little bit of time discussing just the general features of bones, um, you know, especially the general features of long bones. And a lot of these features are going to translate into other types of bones, all right? But there's some terms that you need to know that are associated with these uh, various types of bones as well. So basically, when you're looking at a long bone, okay, there are a few, there's a couple different parts to a long bone. And again, bear with my art here. Um, this is supposed to be a humerus, the bone of your brachial region or your arm. Um, you know, but if you look in, your, in an anatomy book, you know, those of you who are in my class, if you go to page 176 for this, if you want to see a much better representation than that. Uh, all right, but what you'll notice is that, that these long bones, if you look at them on the outside, they have a couple major structural surface features, all right? And now basically these long bones have two major parts. They've got a, they got a central shaft and they have these enlarged ends, all right? And the central shaft is what's called the diaphysis, all right, the diaphysis. And the enlarged ends are what are called the, uh, singularly the epiphysis, or poorly you call them the epiphyses. Okay, so then, it, you know, it, yes, if you want to pluralize, make it plural. Um, now, basically, when you take a look at these, all right, so great, now you know the names of those, but what's the significance of them? Now, the, the, um, the epiphyses are basically, like I said, the enlarged ends of these long bones, and they're enlarged because, you know, one, these, this is the parts of the, these are the parts of the long bones that form joints, all right, where bones, uh, come together to form movable joints, all right, and there is a lot of mechanical stress, you know, being applied to these, uh, to these ends of the bone. This, you know, these ends are where a lot of muscles attach, all right? And like I said in a previous video, very briefly, I, I introduced the concept of remodeling, all right? Like I said, bones are constantly adding tissue and removing tissue from themselves, all right? And like I said, the more mechanical stress that you apply to a bone, the, it's going to respond naturally by enlarging, by depositing more tissue. All right, so these areas, these enlarged, goofy-looking ends of the of the long bones, like I said, these are areas where tendons of muscles are coming in and attaching. These are areas where weight is being applied in from different directions. So as there's, so the combination of the weight-bearing aspects of these bones and the force of muscles constantly tugging and pulling on them, you know, to, during contraction to create movement. All right, forces the bones to, to model themselves around the stress. All right, that's why, you know, whenever you see a bulge or a rounded off end, you know, a tubercle, tuberosity, trochanter, um, you know, the general, you know, kind of bumps and landmarks you see on bones, those are areas of stress. Okay, those are areas of mechanical stress. And that's why, um, the, you know, the ends of all the long bones look different because there's different, there, there's different amounts of stress coming from, you know, uh, different numbers of muscle groups and also coming from different directions. All right, so those are the epiphyses. Now, the epiphyses is, you know, like I mentioned in the previous video as well, um, about the shapes of bones, resemble the, the structure of this resembles that of a flat bone, all right? And you kind of go over to this image over here. This is basically, remember, flat bones are designed, now it resembles it, it doesn't completely resemble it, but remember, um, flat bones have compact bone on the outside and then spongy bone on the inside. What's different about this is that you know flat bone is going to have another you know fairly thick layer of compact bone on the in on the on the, on the other side of the flat bone. Like I said, it's like a bony sandwich. Okay. Now with the long bone, there's going to be kind of a thin layer of of structural bone here, but realistically, it's not. It, it's, it's it's all spongy bone up here. I mean, okay. Now um now basically what you have here is on the outside you have compact bone. Okay. You've got compact bone. And then and all within the inner workings of this, this bulky end, you know, whether it's a head or a trochanter or a tubercle, whatever it is you're thinking about, there's spongy bone all in here, these porous networks, all right? And these pores, you know, the, the kind of the, 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 the spaces created here are called trabeculae. Okay, trabeculae. Now, within these pores, within these spaces, you find bone marrow. Okay, so remember that these that these ends of the of these long bones are, you know, again, they're fairly strong, but they're also light, all right? And now within, the, you know, now within this, again, there's bone marrow. Now, 
in the proximal ends, in the proximal epiphyses of these long bones, especially the femur and the humerus, you find a lot of red bone marrow. Okay, so remember, these are hemopoietic tissues, okay? Um, you know, remember, hemopoiesis, the, 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 the process of making blood cells. All right, not blood, but blood cells, all right? Now, you'll notice, Neil, remember, I also I previously said that red bone marrow is just really thick blood with a lot of stem cells and brand new red blood cells, white blood cells, and megakaryocyte for platelet production, all right? And then basically what happens, you create, notice how you've got blood vessels working their way through the compact structures of the compact bone, and then they network into the spon into the red bone marrow, into the spongy bone. So basically, you form these big, large capillaries. They're called sinusoids. You'll learn more about them a little later on. Sinusoids meaning they have very large sinuses or spaces between the cells that make up the capillaries. And so as a result, when we develop these new blood cells, they're able to squeeze into these bigger capillaries and then squeeze into the circulating blood. All right? And... So that's basically, I mean, what you see going on here with this red bone marrow on the proximal ends. All right, you know, again, you've got blood vessels coming in, you form these new blood cells, and then they circulate, they get into the circulation, and then do what they have to do from there. All right. Um, now you'll notice structural similarities between the compact bone of the, of the shaft, the diaphysis, and also of the, of the head as well. You'll notice there's these circular structures. Okay, and then these little specks kind of around here, all right? I'm going to talk more in depth about these in a little bit when I get more into bone tissue. But these are what are called the, you know, one of these circles, is, you know, one of these circles in the, in the surround, surrounding cells is called an osteon, all right? That's what we call, consider, and abbreviate this, the functional unit of bone. Remember, a functional unit is the smallest part of a bone, or you know, a functional unit is the smallest part of a machine that can allow it to do its job. All right, and um, and osteons are the functional units of bones. What they are, they're basically just a system of canals and cells. All right, and the, you know there's a system of these canals called aversion canals, and surrounding these canals are cells, osteocytes, that are embedded within the bone tissue. All right, and it makes sense because these cells want to be close to the blood. They want to be, you know, they want to be close to the oxygen. And, to, and, and uh, also to eliminate uh, nutrients, in their, I'm sorry, eliminate waste, all right? So you have all these, these circular perversion canals with, with cells that surround them, all right? And, um, and you know, then you have a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in another second, but that's what compact bone basically is, right? It's, just a, it's a big uh, canal network of blood vessels and nerves. Um, now, if you go down to the diaphysis, the shaft of the bone, you'll notice that, um, that basically the diaphysis is made up of primarily compact bone, all right? And then the, di the shaft is hollow in the center, all right? It's hollow in the center. Now, if I apologize. I don't have a yellow marker. Um, you know, this is supposed to be yellow bone marrow, right? Remember that fatty substance I said you find within the shaft and the distal ends of the long bones? All right, so you've got yellow bone marrow in here. Like I said, it's just there taking up space. It makes the suitcase good when you cook with it. Um, all right, now this con now basically what you have going on here is you've got this yellow bone marrow. You just got this long network of canals, you know, with blood vessels running up and down the bone to keep it nourished. Um, and what's going to say? Now one thing about this compact bone is that, like I said, it's compact. It's a lot more dense than spongy bone. All right, so when you put weight on it, it's going to be very, very resilient to stress. Now, at the same time, though, bear, bear in mind, this is a living biologic tissue. It's not like a solid surface, like a chalkboard or a tabletop. It does have some bend and flex to it. Okay, so you bear weight, you know, on the ends of these uh, of the of your long bones, and then that weight, that energy from that weight is transferred down the shaft, all right? And that shaft is going to have a little bit of bend to it. All right, but that's good because, you know, the more flexible the bones are, the more they can withstand the energy from the weight, all right? So that makes it, so that, that alone makes it, you know, a combination of the compact bone and, the, and still yet the flexibility of that bone makes it pretty tough to break, all right? Uh, now, also surrounding the bone, uh, on the, around the diaphysis and part of the proximal ends of the bone as well, actually, let's just say the bone in general, there is a very thin layer of connective tissue. I have a drawn green around here, and again, I apologize for the artwork here, um, called
called the peri called the periosteum. All right, peri meaning around and osteum bone. Okay. Now the periosteum is just a layer of connective tissue that surrounds the bone tissue. Now basically you see that there's blood vessels, there's vessel and nerve networks inside the compact bone and within the spongy bone itself. But how does the how do the blood vessels get into this solid tissue? That's via the periosteum. All right, the periosteum, like I said, is just a very thin sheet of connective tissue that has blood vessels and nerves that network their way into the bone through these little openings called nutrient foramen. All right, and then the vessels disperse and branch out, travel through these subversion canal systems, and then nourish the you know the osteocytes, you know, giving you know, giving the, the cells of bone tissue nourishment. Um, and also nerve supply, or nerve innervation, I should say. Um, and the periosteum is also important because there are cells that are uh, kind of on the underside of the periosteum that are called osteogenic cells, all right? And basically these are cells that, remember, genic, genesis means to make, uh, to create, when you think of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. These cells help us heal bone t tissue if we break it. All right, so the periosteum plays a very important role in healing in healing fractures. All right, you know, one in part because of the vessel network here, because of the osteogenic cells in there as well. So the periosteum is how the bone gets its nourishment from the circulatory system and how nerves get into the bone itself. All right, and that's why, you know, when you look at a bone, you know, coming out of a fresh body, um, you know, whether it's a chicken, a human, a cadaver, whatever it is, bones don't look just pure white. All right, they have kind of a yellowish, greenish tinge to them. And that's because of the periosteum around the outside of the bone. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that on the also on the epiphyses, I forgot to mention this. My apologies. There is this blue represents something called articular cartilage. So remember, you you have this cartilage here as a rubbery surface in between the bones as they form joints. All right, because remember that, you know, bones are going to be somewhat contacting each other. But instead of having bone rubbing on bone, we take a, we take a, kind of a, we, we take a, we create a rubbery substance called hyaline cartilage and place it around the proximal, you know, the proximal and distal ends of these bones to basically reduce friction and wear and tear. And this is what happens when people have osteoarthritis as they age, this cartilage starts to break down and you lose that protective rubbery membrane in between the bones. And then you start to have bone contacting each other, and that's why it hurts so bad. All right, because you know that's causing a lot of wear and tear and stress on the bone itself. All right, so that's the articular cartilage, the shaft, the compact bone, spongy bone. Um, you know, we already discussed you know, the structure of flat bone, really. I mean, again, it's just two layers of compact bone with some spongy in the middle. And remember, we said there's a lot of hematopoietic tissue in there as well. But again, these are the general features of bones, especially of long bones. Um, you know, again, they have epiphyses and large ends that are made up of, of compact bone and spongy bone, which makes it light. And also, this is where you find red bone marrow, at least in the proximal end, this will end with yellow marrow. Um, and then there's articular cartilage that's designed to reduce friction and make it easier for joints to, you know, create movement without pain. And then you've got, in the center of, of these long bones, you've got what's called compact bone, or the diaphysis, I should say, the shaft. Um, it's compact bone with a hollow center. Um, you know, depending on what book you read, this hollow center is going to be called the medullary canal. All right, or it could be called the, just some people just call it the marrow canal, depending, again, on what you guys call it. It doesn't matter as long as you use it in the right context. I call it medullary because, you know, medulla means middle. Um, you know, so we've got compact bone, which is strong yet flexible, and then throughout this compact bone, you have these osteons, which form these canal-like networks um, for the movement of blood vessels and nerves, you know, throughout the bone itself. And then surrounding the entirety of the bone, you have this tissue called the periosteum, which is used to, again, give blood supply and nourishment 